All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you giving us an hour of your time um, on this evening today. My name is Adrian Keller. I work for Solar United Neighbors. I'm the Arizona Program Associate, uh, and I live in Phoenix. Also with me today is my colleague, Vincent Yurkovich. He will be here to answer your questions. Um, and we are happy to, you are here. Before we get started, um, if you're listening to me, I hope that you have joined the Zoom and your audio is connected. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Uh, we are in webinar mode, uh, so you are all muted, but you can submit questions in the chat. Uh, Vincent will be answering them throughout the presentation. I will also take a couple uh, breaks to answer any questions out loud that we need to. Uh, and just be informed that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will be sharing the recording to anybody who registered but wasn't able to attend. All right, and with that, let's get started. The work that we're able to do in Northern Arizona uh, would not be possible without our collaborative partners. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to have worked in with uh, these three partners previously last year, and again this year to partner with us. Uh, City of Flagstaff, City of Sedona, and Coconino County. Uh, we're incredibly thankful for all your help. And I would like to let Alicia Peck introduce herself and the City of Sedona. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Peck. I am the new Sustainability Manager for City of Sedona, and we're so excited to be participating with the Northern Arizona Solar Co-op for the second year. Um, because it's another tool that we have in reaching those goals of emissions reductions, and it's another resource that we can put in the hands of our residents to help you lower not only your, your energy consumption from the grid, but also help making solar panels affordable for everyone. So thank you for coming tonight, and I hope we get to learn right along, alongside of you. Thanks, Alicia. Also joining us is DC Alatore from City Flagstaff. Hi all, uh, Ramon DC Alatore. I am the climate analyst with the city of Flagstaff. Forgot to tell you, I had a uh, job title change recently, Adrian, uh, but I was involved with the uh, first round of the solar cop, uh, really went well and just happy to uh, say hello and let you all know that um, certainly as this process goes along, you can be in touch with Solar United Neighbors. You can also be in touch uh, with staff at the city, either Flagstaff, Sedona, or Coconino County. Uh, it really is a collaborative partnership. We were really excited about uh, the direction uh, that it went, and we're just happy to be available uh, to anyone uh, throughout this entire process. So thank you, and uh, thank you to Solar United Neighbors for uh, making this happen once again. You're welcome. All right, so what is Solar United Neighbors? Uh, if you're here, you've probably heard a little bit about us, um, but just so we're all on the same page, Solar United Neighbors is a membership-based national nonprofit. Uh, we have field staff in 12 states. We organize primarily around solar policy issues. We ourselves are not a solar installer, and in fact, we are vendor neutral. And we really focus on consumer advocacy, solar education, and outreach in the community. In short, our mission is to help people go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. And that mission really began back in 2007. Uh, here pictured is our, our founder, Anya Schoolman, as well as her uh, son, Diego and Walter. And uh, back in 2007, uh, they saw the documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, you may have heard of it. Um, and these kids came back to their mom, they said, hey, this is a really big deal. This is super important. We have to go solar. We have to do our part. This is really important. Anya looked into it and quickly found that the process of going solar, especially back in 2007, uh, was really challenging. Uh, they're getting different information from different people. They're trying to work through tax credits and electrical upgrades and financing options. And it's a really complicated process. And so they listed the help of their community. They literally went door to door um, and about 50 neighbors all together kind of untangled this complicated process. Um, and throughout that process, they were able to also get a bulk discount on their solar panels. And this was really kind of the first solar co-op that we had. After that, Anya started getting calls from around the country, people wanting to learn more about how they did solar and went together as a group, uh, what that process was like. And we have been, been growing ever since. Since 2007, we've been able to help over 6,500 families go solar. 
uh, that's installing more than 56 megawatts of combined solar capacity and that saved 783,000 tons of CO2 over the lifetime of those systems. We've been in Arizona since 2019, um, and since that time, we've been able to help almost 300 people go solar. Uh, that's installing more than two megawatts of installed capacity. Um, and we calculate the investment in, in the local solar economy, as well as the millions of dollars that people have saved in their energy bills over the years. We estimate it's created roughly 43 local solar jobs, and of course, offset tens of thousands of metric tons of CO2. So we at Solar United Neighbors, we help people go solar uh, either through the co-op or by themselves. And that includes homeowners, businesses, nonprofits, uh, houses of worship, and that list is constantly growing. We bring people together and that includes this information session, our co-ops, uh, solar tours, happy hours, lobbying days. We provide resources to help solar enthusiasts um, effectively advocate for their rights. And that covers policies like net metering, uh, making sure HOA members have access to rooftop solar, and so many other important policies that we are fighting for across the nation, uh, but many of them right here in Arizona. And before we get into the presentation, um, I just want to take a moment to address some of the inequities in our current energy system. Uh, we know that communities of color, particularly the Black community, bear an unfair share of the costs of energy production, but receive fewer benefits. Families of color are disproportionately harmed by higher utility bills and shutoffs. And on top of that, housing discrimination is a barrier to home ownership and thus solar ownership. When Sun started with a group of economically and racially diverse neighbors back in 2007, they focused on solar because it helped people pay their electric bills. It also helped them stay in their homes at a time when DC was being gentrified quickly and the whole country was in the middle of a financial crisis. Rooftop solar lets communities invest locally, it creates good paying jobs, and it brings control of the energy system within our reach. We're working hard towards a new energy system, one that everyone can participate in, it's fair and equitable. So today we're gonna to review some of the basics of solar technology the economics of solar, including financing, and then how the co-op process works. And we'll start with solar technology. So how do solar panels work? Uh, you see them on the roofs, you see them driving by, how do they work? Um, essentially, and keep in mind, this is a 101, so we're being pretty basic level here. But when we're talking about solar, uh, we're talking about solar photovoltaics or PVs. And this is a technology that converts solar energy, sunlight into usable electricity. The majority of today's market is PV. Solar thermal or solar hot water used to be more popular years ago, but today's solar PV makes up the vast majority of the market, and that's what we'll be focusing on. So the panel is made up of individual solar cells, uh, silicon kind of being that key ingredient in there. There are usually about 60 to 70 cells per panel. They're kind of sandwiched between those glass frames. And the panels are fairly large. They're about six feet by three and a half feet. Uh, so keep in mind, you know, you need some space on your roof to be able to put them together. Uh, and when you put panels together, uh, we refer to that as a solar array. And just to talk a little bit about how that panel gets attached to your roof. Uh, so they do get attached with a racking system. Uh, what you need to know is there's generally a racking system for any kind of roof. Uh, we'll get in a little bit more into the specifics, but this is sort of that typical asphalt shingle roof where the rails are screwed into uh, the roof and then those solar panels are clipped onto the beams. If you have a flat roof, uh, they may ballast the panels down, essentially weighing them down, uh, or the installer may use a pitch pocket system that pitches the, the solar panels uh, so that it's angled at the ideal uh, location to receive the most sunlight. And some people who have um, some extra land or in rural areas may be interested in ground mounted solar, uh, which can be an option uh, if maybe your roof isn't in an ideal location or it's too shaded. Um, ground mounted solar, what you need to know is obviously you need enough space to be able to handle um, a system, be able to face it in the right direction. Um, and just, it can be a little bit more expensive because you have to build the system that hooks it into the ground, uh, but this can definitely be an option for folks with a little more land. 
And one of the most essential parts of the, the system is the inverter. Uh, so that is going to take that direct current energy from the solar panel and invert it into alternating current. Uh, so your home can utilize that power. Uh, there are essentially two different types of inverters and uh, your installer is probably going to have a preferred method. It's not like you need to choose which one uh, you're interested in, but just to, so you're aware, uh, string inverters kind of string through one central box and they work great if it's more of a simple, um, simple installation with just one or two arrays. Um, micro inverters essentially invert the energy at the panel level and they work really efficiently, especially if there's some shade in certain areas. Uh, they make sure that the whole system is being optimized to, to produce the maximum amount of power. And for connecting the solar to your home's electricity, it's usually a, a pretty simple connection to your electric box. Uh, most homes don't need any upgrades to be able to handle solar, but some do, especially older homes who may need an upgrade. Uh, we always make sure to ask installers when they bid on our co-op uh, what that pricing might look like for an electrical system upgrade. So you're aware of that going in. And just some terminology that we'll be using throughout the presentation. Uh, when we talk about a kilowatt, that is a unit of power. So it's used to describe the size of a system uh, in thousand watt increments. So 1000 watts is one kilowatt. A system made up of 10 350 watt panels, we'd call that a 4.2 kilowatt system. Kilowatt hours, on the other hand, is a unit of energy. And so that's what you would see on your utility bill. It's measuring the amount of electricity that your system is going to produce. It also describes the amount of energy that you may purchase from the utility. Um, in Arizona, average installations for solar are about seven or eight kilowatts. And so just to put all the pieces together, uh, you've got your solar array, which is absorbing the sunlight. Um, it's being fed into the solar inverter, which is converting that DC into AC current. It's going through your electrical panel, which is kind of the brains of the system is how I think of it. So it's directing power where it needs to go and when. And then if you have solar, you're going to have a bi-directional utility meter. So that's going to read uh, not only any electricity you're purchasing from the grid, but it will also read and measure any excess solar that you've produced that will be fed back to the grid as well. I'm sure you've heard of net metering. It's a really important policy that has really been the driver of rooftop solar in this country for years. Essentially with a net metering, um, it tracks the flow of electricity to you, to and from you, the customer. And when you're generating more power than you are using, that extra energy goes back to the utility and is counted on your meter for credit. And historically you'd receive credit on your bill for that excess production at the same price you would have paid for it, that one-to-one -one ratio. And unfortunately today that system is going away. Uh, we've changed from net metering in Arizona to a system called export rate credits. So instead of getting that one-to-one -one exchange for what you'd be getting credited for your solar, you're getting a set rate, which is unfortunately lower than what it used to be. Uh, so when we refer to export credits, that's what you're getting paid uh, for solar you feed back to the utility. So for this co-op, uh, everybody should be in APS territory. And so just to take a look at the plans they have um, for new solar customers. So they've got uh, two, two plans. One is time of, they're both time of use and one has a demand charge, one doesn't. And so that range in there is because the price you're paying is gonna depend on the time of day, but also the time of year. Super off-peak charges refer to you know, super low rate during off peak hours of the day. That demand charge in there is a single charge you would get for the period of the month where you're producing the highest usage. Um, and that's measured in dollars per kilowatt hour. And then that solar export rate credit uh, is the current rate that APS pays solar customers back for any solar they feed back onto the grid. Um, and either of these plans might work for, for your situation, but we, we tend to find that with APS customers, they favor this time of use simple plan without the demand charges. That's because even though your energy charges are a little bit higher, you are avoiding that demand charge and your solar is going to do a better job of covering the most amount of energy you consume in that billing cycle. <clears throat> 
And just to give you a rough example of what that might look like with that uh, basic time of use plan, you're getting charged for the energy used during on peak hours and then during off peak hours, uh, fixed charges from APS as well as taxes, that's that 13 bucks. And then solar export rate credit, what you're getting back for energy you didn't use. <clears throat> and then uh, resulting in your net total of about 80 bucks there for, for this example. So what makes a good site for solar? The orientation of your house is really important here. Uh, facing south for your roof is the best because you're getting the most amount of sun exposure and you're gonna be able to generate the most amount of power throughout the day. Facing west is also okay. Uh, if you're thinking about solar and its benefit to your electricity bill, you really wanna be able to generate as much power to offset uh, the most expensive energy. The most expensive energy is usually during the end of the day. So having solar panels on the west uh, can, be, can help offset some of that power. Um, you also wanna make sure that you don't have a big tree or some other large structure that is shading a lot of your roof or where you're gonna planning on putting the panels. If that is the case, you may wanna consider trimming the tree or if you're really attached to that tree, then maybe solar isn't gonna work for you, but that is a consideration. And you also wanna make sure there's enough space on your roof to be able to install the solar array. Uh, like I mentioned, the panels are fairly large, so you're gonna need enough space to put them in conjunction with one another. One of the cool things about the co-op is that when you join, uh, we at Sun actually perform a free satellite roof review uh, to make sure that the orientation of your roof, the space, the shading uh, is all gonna make sure that you're able to, to, to have solar or not. So it's a really great uh, pre-screening process that we do. So what happens when the power goes out? Uh, if there's a, a monsoon storm or a winter storm that you guys have up in Northern Arizona, uh, when the grid goes down, your solar is gonna shut off. And this is really a safety mechanism built in the inverter to shut, shut down the solar uh, from the grid so that, um, and it's really a safety mechanism for the utility workers uh, so that when they're out there working on a down line or something, there's not any solar being fed back into the grid um, um, that could, could hurt them. So if you do want to have power when the grid goes down, you may want to look into batteries. A few reasons to consider why you may want a battery. Um, if you have frequent utility outages and you need a source of backup power, if you wanna be able to power critical loads at home, think things like medical equipment or other appliances that you would be of great concern if the power went out. Uh, for general emergency and disaster preparedness, um, and increasingly people are using batteries to offset some of the energy during those peak periods when power is most expensive. A lot of the batteries out today can actually be programmed so that your home is drawing from them uh, during that most expensive hours of the day. And then your solar will recharge those batteries uh, during the day so that you're saving money during that five to seven peak, peak time. All right, if you're interested in really diving into batteries, we put together a pretty comprehensive guide on anything you could might want to know about batteries. Uh, that's at solarunitedneighbors.org slash storage. And we're, of course, here to answer any questions you may have about batteries as well. Just to give you kind of a real world example of what this might look like. So the Johnsons have purchased a 13.5 kilowatt hour battery bank. It's charged by their solar system every day. And if the sun isn't shining, they have about an, a day's worth of power with that battery. And that's gonna run their refrigerator, their microwave, uh, some lights and outlets, a cable modem, small window air conditioner, but it's not gonna power their stove, dryer, electric water heater, anything else that has a really large load on the system. Uh, and this is a, a fairly new program from APS uh, where they will actually give you up to $3,750 if you purchase a battery storage system. Um, two different ways of doing that. Either way, you will be sharing some of the performance data about that battery with APS. But if you also allow APS to actually use some of the energy from that battery, um, then they'll give you an extra 1250 bucks. And APS is really interested in learning about the distributed grid and, and how that might build into to better grid reliance in the future. And so that's kind of why they're putting forward this rebate. Um, they really want to understand the data and look into how this works in the real world. 
So some FAQs I wanted to get to before we start answering any more specific questions. Um, first, warranties. A typical installation is gonna come with three different types of warranties. So there's a power production warranty. Uh, it's typically 25 years. And this basically guarantees that by year 25, the solar panels are still gonna produce a certain amount of power that they did at year one, usually about 90%. Uh, also gonna be a parts warranty that will cover the solar panels, the inverters, and any other physical materials. And then there's gonna be a labor warranty uh, that'll cover any roof penetrations or work done by the installation company. Uh, and that can vary pretty widely, but we usually see about two to 10 years for labor warranties. Homeowners insurance, when you add solar to your roof, you definitely wanna call your insurance company and let them know that you're adding solar. Most people don't see an increase when you add solar, and if there is an increase, you should ask why, uh, why that's the case, and maybe you want to shop around depending kind of on how much that increase is. But solar panels actually do protect your roof uh, from hail and rain and other environmental factors, so some companies actually consider them an asset. Maintenance. Most solar systems are low maintenance. They're not no maintenance, but they're pretty low maintenance. Uh, normal precipitation will keep them clean, but if there's a really large dust storm, uh, you may want to hose them off or call a cleaning company to make sure they're, they're performing as they need to. Every few years, it's recommended you have a visual inspection done uh, and make sure you're checking the production regularly. Most of those inverters that we talked about come with an app that actually tracks real-time production of your solar system. So that's always something that, to keep an eye on to make sure that your system's operating um, as you're expecting it to. How long the system lasts? Uh, solar panels last a really long time if you take care of them. Like I said, most of those warranties are about 25 years, but uh, the panels will keep producing power well beyond that, more like 30 plus years if they're well taken care of. If you live in a homeowners association uh, in Arizona, we have a law that says HOAs cannot block you from adding solar. They can put in rules and regulations that may require some kind of design review through the HOA board, but there's been a state Supreme Court decision that says at the end of the day, uh, they cannot stop you from adding solar to your home. And if you live in a historic district, we'd always just encourage you to check the district guidelines. Uh, they vary pretty much from city to city. Uh, some cities have requirements that say the, the panels can't be viewed from the street, for example. Uh, so if they're on the back side of the roof, that might be okay. But we just encourage you to check with your, your historic district, make sure that you wouldn't lose any sort of tax benefits from adding solar. All right, I'm going to take a brief pause here and just check to make sure. Um, Vincent, are there any questions we need to answer or should I keep going? Uh, feel free to keep going. All right, let's talk about solar economics. So this is one of my favorite graphs to look at. Uh, I love to see this, this really dramatic decrease in the price of solar. Solar really is increasingly affordable. Costs have come down dramatically over the past 40 years. Um, but even just these last 10 years, we've really seen costs drop. Uh, and this graph represents that average cost per kilowatt. Um, and this isn't really just, you know, a specialty boutique project anymore. Uh, solar has a really great return on investment, uh, particularly if you're able to take advantage of uh, federal tax credits and other incentives. This kind of breaks down why the cost of solar is what it is. Um, and this is generally across the, the landscape. You know, every solar company is differently, but this is typically what we see in the industry. Uh, that yellow part on the bottom is system components, the actual cost of the solar panels, the inverters, and anything else you'll need. And as you can see, those costs have come down a lot over the past 10 years. That green sliver is the labor costs, um, stayed relatively steady. Um, and this big orange cost is soft costs. So anything that doesn't have to do with labor or the physical parts. Um, and a big, big part of that is marketing. And we found that a lot of solar companies, um, when they break it down per signed contract, it can cost them thousands of dollars uh, just to find customers and get them to a point of signed contract. Um, when you contrast that with Solar United Neighbors, we charge $600 
um, for every signed contract from the installer. So it's a really great bang for their buck as we're handing them a list of well-educated, excited people who know about solar, who know what they want. Um, they're able to save a lot of money and be able to pass those savings on to you, which is one of the really big advantages of the co-op. So the federal tax credit um, is where you can take on your federal income taxes off the cost of the system. Unfortunately, it is decreasing. It's 26% for this year. It'll drop to 22% next year. Uh, if Congress doesn't change anything, that will drop to 0% in 2024. Um, and one other thing, and I'll have a slide for this, but I just wanted to, to mention that export rate that we talked about, that APS pays you for how much solar you feed back to the grid. Um, that also drops every year, typically around the fall, they drop at about 10%. Uh, the good thing is if you go solar now, this summer or early fall, you'll be locked in at that higher rate, which means your payback period for your solar system is going to be a lot shorter. We can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so federal income tax uh, credit in, in Arizona, we also have a 25% state tax credit um, up to $1,000 though. So most people are just able to claim that $1,000. Arizona has a property tax exemption law. It says that the county assessor is not allowed to increase your property tax liability for installing solar, even if it does increase your property value. We don't pay sales taxes on solar panels in Arizona. And we talked a little bit about that HOA law that protects homeowners from installing rooftop solar. All right, just to give folks a little bit about what those numbers uh, might look like. Um, again, this is an average that $3 per watt here that we're basing this off of is actually a little high. We're seeing systems usually a little bit cheaper than that, but nice round number to give you kind of an example of how these credits work. Uh, so we've got a four kilowatt system and an eight kilowatt system. The average price of the system minus that 26% federal income tax credit minus another thousand bucks from the state resulting in your net costs for the system. And then those bottom three rows look at the estimated electricity savings of year one, year 10, and year 25. Um, and you can see that even for a smaller system size, you're still winding up with uh, quite a bit of profit that you weren't paying in electric bills over those 25 years. All right, so there are multiple ways to finance your system. Um, of course, you are, if you are able to pay cash up front, that will be the highest upfront cost, but will also maximize your savings. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about loans in the next slide, but uh, we've broken down a lot of your options on our website that you can see there. Third party, this covers power purchase agreements and leases, uh, where essentially a third party owns the solar panels and then you are leasing the power from them. So you won't own the system at the end of the term. Um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of poor leasing products sold to customers uh, where they end up paying more than if they had just not done anything at all, which is not the point of having solar. It's supposed to save you money. Um, because of this and because it also makes it really tricky if you move, we highly recommend that if you're able to um, finance a system, uh, that way you'll own it at the end of the life and you'll maximize your savings over time. And then one grant we like to make sure people are aware of is the Rural Energy for America program. This is a grant and loan offer to rural business owners. It covers energy efficiency upgrades as well as solar panels. And so some of the loan options, uh, we first like to just emphasize to everybody that we encourage you to shop around and find a loan product uh, that works best for you. Uh, no matter what installer, they'll usually have a preferred financing company that they'd like you to work through. Um, and many times that's a really great deal, but we just encourage people to look at their options. Um, a common option for folks is to go through a home equity line of credit. Uh, you can also refinance your home, an option to include solar. Uh, like we said, you can go through the financing company with the installer. Co-op members also have access to loans through the Clean Energy Credit Union or Community First Credit Union. Uh, you only have access to these loans as a solar co-op member, and they tend to offer pretty great rates and really low fees. All right, and to finish things off, we will talk a little bit about how the co-op process works. 
So Solar United Neighbors, we've run over 300 of these across the country. Um, and it's really become a pretty well-oiled machine at this point that we consistently see positive results from. Some of the benefits of going solar through the co-op. First, we aggregate lots of consumers together. So everyone goes solar at the same time through a competitively selected installer. This helps you save money on the installation since the group is getting a bulk deal. Of course, we can't guarantee that this will save you money, but co-ops tend to receive about 20% lower pricing uh, than if you went out and saw your own installation. And then Sun also helps support you through the process. We provide expert technical guidance on any solar questions you may have. We help you make an informed decision that you really feel confident about. And we help you connect to solar lovers in your neighborhood. So you can become part of a growing movement that has a broader impact on solar nationwide. So the co-op process um, is typically about six months. It's a little bit shorter for this one, uh, just because we have a shorter window for Northern Arizona. Uh, so we launched uh, earlier this month and you are all at step one. You're here, you're learning about the co-op, you're learning about solar at the info session. Um, if any of this is interesting to you, we hope that you'll go to our website and sign up for the co-op. Um, and if you do, we hope that you'd spread the word with your friends, uh, your neighbors, your coworkers, anybody who doesn't like paying their electric bill. Um, this is a, a strength by numbers kind of thing. And we have a goal for this co-op uh, to reach 100 folks. We're at 81 last I checked. So we really hope that we'll be able to, to reach that goal. Step four is the installer selection process. Uh, so once the co-op has 30 members, uh, Solar United Neighbors is going to issue a competitive RFP request for proposal for solar installers on behalf of the co-op. And we're actually going to be issuing this on Friday. So we at Sun are going to accept those bids, uh, review their references, licensing, insurance, uh, make sure everything is up to the standard that it needs to be. And then we at Solar United Neighbors are vendor neutral. It's really important that the people who are going to get solar installed uh, are the ones choosing the installer. So a group of co-op members will come together for an evening and choose this installer based on the priorities of the co-op. Once that installer is chosen, we'll let everybody know in the co-op. And then over the course of the next few weeks, the installer is going to start reaching out to everybody who is a member. Uh, about three months later for this one, again, it is uh, July 31st is the last day to sign up. Um, that is the last, the, the installer is going to be talking through you throughout this point. They'll uh, look at your roof, check out your electricity bills and come up with a customized solar proposal for your roof, uh, but based on that uh, negotiated co-op pricing. Up until this point, um, it, if the pricing and system look right to you, and you feel really confident in your financing options um, and the solar system, we hope that you will go ahead and sign that contract to go to solar. Then it usually takes a few weeks for the installer to work through the permitting and everything. Uh, the installation itself actually only takes a day, maybe a day and a half. A few weeks later, you'll have the, your finalized project. Uh, you'll have a permission to operate from the utility and your solar system will be turned on and begin producing energy for your home. Once the installations um, are completed, we will all meet again and celebrate the successes of the co-op um, and the impact that we were able to have here in Northern Arizona. So like I said, I hope that if this is uh, sounds good to you that you'll check out our website. Uh, we're at solarunitedneighbors.org. If you wanna look at this particular co-op, it's backslash NAZ 2022. I'm sure we'll drop that link in the chat as well. And with that, I really appreciate everybody listening to my presentation. Uh, we're going to open it up to some, some questions if we have any. Looks like Vincent's been doing a good job of answering everything in the chat. Dwayne just asked, do co-op members have an option to go completely off-grid, assuming they also have sufficient battery storage? Oh, Vincent, are you able to answer that question? It's not typical for people who get solar to go off grid, especially if they're in um, a residential area. 
if you're more rural, um, it may be a possibility, but that would just be a discussion to have with um, the specific installer. It would likely require not only batteries, but an additional source of uh, power, maybe like geothermal or, or maybe wind or something like that, small wind. Um, so it's, it's possible, but probably very difficult and impractical. Uh, looks like Rick Barman has a raised hand. Can we unmute him? Rick, you're unmuted. Or you're not unmuted, but we've given you permission to speak if you'd like to. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. Hi, Rick. Okay, thank you. So, Vincent, you say first come, first serve basis. Can you explain what that means in this eight step process? Uh, that we talked about. And so what what is the first come part of the first come first serve basis? Sure. So we have, like Adrian said, about 80 members in the group. Um, those folks have been signing up for the last four weeks or so. The RFP will go out on Friday, this Friday, and it will be due in two weeks. At that point, we will select an installer um, like maybe up to two weeks after that. So we're, now we're looking at the end of June. Um, the installer will then get the list of names of everyone in the group and they're gonna go back and look at the people who signed up first just because um, it's, a, it's like just a courtesy or a way to work through the list. However, you'll also be able to contact them at your own discretion. Um, and kind of jump the line, so to speak, um, because some people will just wait to be contacted. Um, and, you know, it may turn out that someone, you know, signs up for the co-op on the last day um, that someone can sign up, but then that's also a day where someone signs their contract. So it's multiple steps happening all at the same time at a certain point in the co-op. Okay, so yeah, I, I talked to a solar company today and they were, eight to 12 weeks out. So if I'm 80th on your list for the co-op and you award this contract and I don't, and I, and I stay 80th, the time frame for me to actually get solar installed is gonna be months to years, uh, it seems like. Where is my math incorrect? That's a good question. Um, so the group will have a deadline, um, a sign up deadline. So it will um, end on a certain date where people can can sign up. I do believe that that is the end of June. I could be wrong about that. Um, but you know, if you are 80th in line, um, the installer typically can contact you know 10 to 30 um, folks a week just by essentially cold calling you. Um, but then, you know, if you were to call them and say, hey, like, I have your information via the co-op process, let's get started, they're not going to be like, oh, no, we still have to contact 50 people. Typically, how it works is if there are 100 people in the group, 30 of them will never get in touch with the installer anyway, just because of attrition. And then there's going to be like 15 to 20 percent who are super amped. And then the installer has to work for the rest. So we usually see like 20 to 30 or 40% of people in the co-op going solar. Um, and so even though we say 100 people are in the group, it's not like 100 people like you are in the group, um, if that helps. Okay, so, so, so based upon the last one of these with rooftop solar, do you have any, you know, any data on uh installation timelines and those i i know on the website it said like adrian said an average of 20 percent savings do you have any data on installation timelines for that last tranche of co-op members we definitely do um i cannot speak to that right now because i don't have the data available and i'm not super familiar with it but if you email us at azteam at solarunitedneighbors.org, um, we'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Okay, thank you, Vincent, I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. 
And then thank you, Adrian, for the presentation. Of course, uh, we have a question about condo associations. Um, if everybody agrees in the condo association, can they go solar together and also claim the tax benefit? Uh, uh, yes, if it's if it's not a nonprofit organization, um, then uh, then you would be able to get the tax benefit. But if it's a nonprofit organization, then you would not be able to get the, the tax benefit. Yeah. So installations for this round. Um, so the sign up deadline is July 31st. But uh, like Vincent mentioned, those installers are going to be reaching out to you ongoing throughout the whole process. Uh, so we expect installations to begin, they say about eight to 12 weeks after. And so I would imagine early fall, late summer for the very earliest installations to begin. Um, it could go a little bit longer than that. Again, it depends on which installer is in selected, what their capacity is, what, what, how busy the season is. It's going to be summer. So we imagine there will be some busyness there, but we really hope to be able to have those installations uh, beginning as soon as possible. I purchased 14 panels last year, very happy with the system. Now I want a battery, excellent. Uh, Mark, yeah, if you would like to uh, sign up for the co-op, you are able to just do battery through the co-op. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention is electric vehicle chargers for your home are also included. So it uh, can be a really great time while they're already working on your system to be able to install uh, a home electric vehicle charger. So you're able to do those two options um, and solar or just one or the other. Uh, Vincent, I might need your help with this one. If you need to change your roofing, I assume this will be need to be done first before installing solar. Correct. That is correct, but I can't remember what the guideline is for how many years left on a roof we recommend. Well, basically, um, if we we kind of say if your roof has less life in it than the system will take to achieve it's ROI, like a simple payback. Let's say that that's 10 years, um, then you would want to uh, replace the roof before. Um, however, if it uh, has more life than that, then we would say go solar now and uh, replace the roof later. The nice thing is that when you put the panels down, they don't, the panels, the shingles or whatever, don't age as fast because they're not in the direct sunlight. So. Uh, that can prolong the roof slightly. And I, you, I think you could uh, bundle the cost of a new roof into the cost of a solar installation, but from my understanding, that portion of the cost would not apply towards the 26% federal income tax credit. That's correct. And if you were to install on the ground, a ground mount, um, how much more would the cost be? So I would say typically it can be uh, maybe 20 to 40% more expensive based on the complexity of the uh, array, the size of the array, you know, how much concrete they need to pour, how, how far away from the uh, main surface panel and how much trenching, if they're trenching through concrete, that sort of thing. Um, if fencing is required by your a AHJ, that can increase the cost. Um, but that is all laid out in the bid. Um, yeah. And yeah, then so we have a question. Sorry, about yeah. the the export rate credit from from uh, APS. So yeah, that um, that is the when APS is going to adjust their rate um, for this year. It's expected to be on October first. And so, yeah, Leonard, that has been a really big priority for us with this co-op. It's one of the reasons why we're doing it when we are and why it's a little bit of a shortened process than normally. Uh, we want to give everybody the highest chance possible to get their system in before that rate drops. Um, and that's based on when it's filed for interconnection with APS from the installer. And so we are being very clear in our communication to anybody who bids on this project uh, that that's gonna be a priority. And we're also making sure to communicate to co-op members that, hey, the faster you work on this, uh, the better chance that you have of getting in before that rate drops. 
Um, so, so yeah, our, our intention is to get as many people in as possible. Uh, of course, there's, there's going to be some stragglers who, who fall a little bit later behind. There always are, but uh, we'll do everything in our power to make sure we can expedite the process. So Mark, we're not really sure. Uh, it can kind of depend with your condo association. Um, we'd love to look into that a little bit more deeply though, if you want to reach out and we can see what, because it would depend partly on how the condo association is organized, how big it is, what your goals are. Um, but I don't know if Vincent has any answers for that, but we but we were happy to dig into that later with you if you'd like. Yeah, we've we've um, helped condo um, boards research solar in the past, um, even like have presented to presented to condo associations. Um, so usually, Condo associations don't make up the majority of the solar co-op customers, so um, that's more of a kind of a bespoke messaging um, as opposed to what we were just talking about today. But yeah, email AZ team and uh, Adrian, myself, or Brett Fanshaw um, will be able to assist. Um, someone's is saying that they're in the county. Is there a county contact? So um, no. So this. Uh, this co-op is, is covering, um, you know, Coconino, Yavapai, um, made also the cities of Flagstaff and Sedona, obviously, but um, we're here um, to help you even if you're in the county. Um, and then regarding Amelia's question, um, we maintain a list, a large list of installers that any installer can join. And so when we do go to RFP, um, request for proposal on Friday. We're gonna be emailing um, probably three or four dozen local Arizona companies plus more that are um, like in the vicinity, but maybe out of state in Utah or something like that, um, who will all have an opportunity to submit bids. And then we'll do our due diligence after. Um, typically we get five, six, seven bids per co-op. And just it just really depends on the amount of interest um, in the community at the time. Rich, go ahead, you, you should be able to speak. Well, this is Roz, his lovely wife. Um, and I have a really basic question, which is, uh, is there a cost to join the co-op? No, there is no cost uh, to join the co-op. Uh, there's also no commitment. So if you join the co-op, uh, you're not required to go solar and you're not required to go solar with that installer. So, so no, no commitment there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We are going to stick around if anybody has any other questions, we're here to answer for them. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much, everybody for attending. We, we appreciate you coming and we hope that you'll, you'll check out the co-op online. Um, but yeah, we'll stay, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. EPTM roof. Vincent, you know anything about EPDM roofs? No, I don't. I don't say that I have a particular knowledge of that type of roof. Um, it's probably a flat roof, and in that case, there. Leonard, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but I know that on flat roofs that may have a leak potential, um, so not quite flat. So they they may do like a ballasted system where instead of penetrating into the roof, you basically just have um, like concrete cinder blocks that sit in these big trays um, that go under the solar panels as part of the racking system. 
but it, it would need like an additional structural analysis to make sure that your your roof can support that because it does weigh a lot more than your traditional um, solar array. How many panels are in an eight kilowatt solar array? Um, so probably 20 um, if you're going off of a 400 watt panel, which could probably be like 650 square feet. I'll actually ask one that I've heard before and I think is helpful for, for clarification, but um, the interconnection agreement, is that after your system is on your roof or is that filed before the system is installed? Um, so I, I don't know the exact answer to that because I think it would depend on the uh, work, the specific work, whatever company gets uh, installed, but um, my traditional, my understanding is traditionally that it is uh, the permitting application gets pulled first, and uh, then there is the construction and then the inspection by the city, and uh, concurrently with that would be the uh, interconnection application, which would follow the approval by the city. Um, so the very last thing that happens is the uh, permission, uh, the interconnection permission, permission to operate PTO is what it's called or interconnection. That's pretty consistent with my understanding. We've had some people even actually have folks knock on their doors and say like, sign a contract now so we can get you in before October 1st. Uh, and that's a little bit dubious. It's not about like when you sign a contract, it is about that interconnection agreement. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, people kind of understand that it's, it's not about like making that decision before October 1st. It really is probably get, get to work on some of that in uh, July as, as soon as you can, uh, because there is a fair bit of a process in order to get to the point of interconnection agreement. Correct. Um, then someone is saying that they have gas kitchen appliances and gas heating doesn't make sense to plan for possible future electricity use if I someday convert or is it easy to add panels in the future. Um, it's not easy, um, but it can be done, especially if you have microinverters because um, each panel is its own electrical circuit. So you don't have to do a lot of uh, like inverter swapping if you had a different type of inverter. Um, you just need to um, Ideally, I would say ideally try to do it all at once, but if you have microinverters, yes, you can add in the future. Um, also, you could um, preemptively add some additional solar based on the um, amount of um, overage you are allowed per APS's regulations. I think it's 120%, Adrian. That sounds right. Yeah, um, and, and they understand that people are going to be buying electric cars, they're going to be switching from gas to electric. So I would start with that 120% and uh, maybe then you can just invest in energy efficiency after that. And you can definitely use the co-op Leonard to um, install on your other house in Camp Verde. Full disclosure, I'm not from the area. So um, if that's not in Coconino or Yavapai, then the answer is no. But if it is, then the answer is yes. Awesome. Great questions, everybody. Thanks. All right. Last call for questions. Otherwise, we're closing up shop. If you want to expand in a few years, can we do it through the co-op? Hopefully, yes. So, um, we are thankful to have had a successful co-op last year. And so we're doing another one this year. Um, we can't guarantee that there's gonna be another one next year and years future, but um, we're not going anywhere. We're, we're operating in the state and we're gonna continue running co-ops wherever there's a need. So, so yes, potentially there's a future co-op you'd be able to, to add on in the future. All right. Thank you, DC. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Vincent. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, really enjoyed this and great questions and great information. So appreciate you guys hosting.
before you get off, Adrian, sorry to interrupt. It says, that, and this is a frequent uh, issue we have, it says it costs $35 to join. So on our website, we have two different types of membership. And I know it's very confusing because we say membership on both cases, but that is a different type of membership, not affiliated with co-op membership. It is very confusing. Um, that's where we've settled as an organization. So it's not a bait and switch. What you want to do is go to solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash NAZ2022-2022. And then there's a big orange button that says join the co-op. And basically you're just filling out your name, address, roof info. Thank you, Adrian. And that um, there's no payment for that. So you're a free co-op member. If you're paying $35, you've taken a wrong turn on our website. That's it. All right, have a good night, everybody.